بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي I am Dr. Mudassir Shahbaz Associate Professor Sahara Medical College in Arawal and as we were discussing about the clinicals of the lower limb and in the previous lecture we have discussed about the clinicals and why we need to know these clinicals. Now today we are going to discuss about the further clinicals. The first is the psoas abscess. Abscess means there will be some infection in the region of psoas muscle where the psoas muscle will be having origination from the abdomen there will be pus forming pus due to the infection of bacteria and then it is uh, attacked by the neutrophils and macrophages and that is converted into the pus so psoas abscess so before uh, we read this page about the psoas abscess uh, in my opinion we should have a look on the facial lining of the abdominal wall. Abdominal wall, uh, here you can see, here is the origin of muscle, that is the psoas, and here is the muscle, iliacus. So when both combine, they form the iliopsoas, and which is inserted over the lacet trochanteric. And here we see that the psoas is having origin from the transverse processes of the uh, lumbar vertebra and uh, the last one the 12th vertebra is the origin of the source major muscle so fascia is lining all over the body so where it will be lining the diaphragm it will be called as diaphragmatic fascia and on the anterior abdominal wall, when this muscle transverses abdominus over the anterior abdominal wall, then it will be called as the fascia transversalis. And when this fascia uh, comes over this muscle, which is quadratus lumborum muscle, here when it covers it, it is named as quadratus lumborum fascia. And then when it covers the swas, then it is the psoas fascia. Down, down when it comes over the iliacus muscle, it will be named as fascia iliaca. So, in the important thing is that here is the arcuate line, the facial attachment of the facial lining and the median, median uh, arcuate ligament. Medial arcuate ligament where it is over the psoas, then is the lateral arcuate ligament where is the over the quadratus lumborum attached at the upper end. So this all will be covered by the fascia. So whatever the process, disease process, pus forming occur, it it is it lies behind this fascia. And <coughs> obviously, when it is lying behind this fascia, it will travel under this fascia and will move into the lower limb below the inguinal ligament under this fascia. So before you have you understand the psoas uh, abscess is formation location, the normal attachment of the fascia and the muscle attachment of the so iliopsoas is very important to know. So then we come to psoas abscess. So it can occur in association with tuberculosis of the vertebral column are secondary to the regional enteritis of the ileum that is a Crohn disease. So in this way the pus can, uh, the abscess can form in this region. When the abscess is between the psoas and, and its facial lining, it travels to the inguinal ligament and proximal region of thigh. There will be severe pain then to the hip thigh or knee. Why? Because the pus is lying behind the iliosophagia and it travels 
in this way and comes to life. So it uh, it is also involving the lumbosacral plexus here, the nerves which are originating for the lower limb, lumbar plexus and uh, especially the lumbar plexus. So when this will be involved, the pain will be referred to the hip joint, to the thigh and to the knee joint. <clears throat> so it is the involvement of the nerves in the lumbar plexus. And uh, abscess, uh, this can come into the inguinal region, inferior to the uh, or superior to the inguinal ligament, and it can be mistaken for the inguinal hernia or femoral hernia. Why? Because if you have seen the diagram below, then you will understand why it can. Here, if below this inguinal ligament it comes down. So it can resemble with the femoral hernia or inguinal hernia. It can resemble swelling. The swelling of the abscess yes, okay. can resemble. And uh, when you take a radiograph, the lateral border will be visible and that abscess shadow can also be visible. It is a case of a source abscess on the right side. You can see the vertebral column. It may be because of tuberculosis of the vertebral column. So swelling here is felt in the lumbar region posteriorly. So here, here in the X-ray it is shown that these vertebras you can see they are not normal. Their bodies are uh, eaten down or they are they have degenerated the bodies of the vertebra. So that can be because of tuberculosis of these vertebras, which will form pus over the iliac uh, psoas muscle. So when the patient will present, it will present pain in the back, swelling in the back, or swelling in the anteriorly, and then pain refers to the hip joint, or the knee joint, or to the thigh. So here in the schematic diagram has been shown, the region of uh, uh, psoas muscle, insertion of psoas muscle, tuberculosis uh, is the most common cause and the Crohn disease of the small intestine, uh, ileum disease is the second common cause. So this, it can uh, enter the facial tube of psoas major and track into the thigh, into the femoral triangle. <coughs> so here it will involve the lumbosacral plexus also. So the pain will be referred to the hip joint and to the anterior of thigh and to the knee joint. Next is a quadriceps paralysis. Quadriceps means quadriceps muscles. Quadri means four muscles. Four muscles we know and in the anterior of thigh the four muscles are the rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius and vastus medialis muscle. They are covering the anterior side of the thigh. So when they will be paralyzed because of nerve damage or because of uh, damage to the vertebral column uh, involved in the lumbar lumbosacral plexus, so because of the uh, some disease process, so there will be paralysis that the movement of these quadriceps muscle is lost. So when these muscle will be paralyzed, so because the, we know that the quadriceps muscles are the strong extensor of the knee joint, so the patient will be unable to extend the knee against the resistance, extend the leg. Here one hand is over the foot and other hand over the thigh and the patient is asked to extend the leg so he will be unable to extend it and this can be felt. The weakness of vastus medialis and lateralis only resulting from the arthritis or trauma to the knee joint can result in abnormal patellar movement, loss of joint stability, but it is related only to the vastus medialis and lateralis which are around the knee joint. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the quadriceps plexus will be loss of uh, extension of the leg, extension of the knee joint. 
So that will lead to a specific gate <coughs> that is named as quadriceps gate. And when the weakness, the uh, body collapses, hence the trunk goes for anterior bending to compensate it, to shift the vertical vector anterior to the knee balance. Because the quadriceps, they are paralyzed, so body will bend forward to compensate this, uh, to shift the vertical vector anterior to the knee balance. Here we can see. And then this gate, with what will develop, it will be called as quadriceps gate. And uh, to stabilize the knee joint, very often it is seen that the patient puts the his effective, uh, uh, hand on that side over the knee to extend the knee joint passively or actively. Here we see the patient is putting hand over the knee, uh, anterior side of the lower end of the thigh or the knee joint and uh, then pushing backward with the head uh, uh, and the lateral pressure of the, the that to walk normally. So it is anterior trunk bending which happen after the damage to the quadriceps muscle. And this the gate thus develop, it, uh, it is called as uh, quadriceps gate. You may have seen uh, in your life the patient walking with the, their hands over the knee joint and uh, limping and uh, with the trunk bended forward and walking, especially some of the beggars you may see, you must might have seen in the streets walking in this way. So that is the quadriceps gait. Next is the patellar bone is very important although this is a sesamoid bone in the anterior side of the thigh but for the walking mechanism it is very important because the damage to this uh, bone will cause the pain in the knee joint and will disturb the walking mechanism. So very first thing is the chondromalacia patella, running runner's knee, because this chondromalacia means the damage to the, here you can see the damage to the hyaline lining of the, inside the uh, patella. And when it will move, it will produce friction and there will be severe pain and it will hinder with the running and walking. So that's why it is called as the runner's knee, called chondromalacia patella. This is due to the deficiency of the, uh, that may be due to the repeated trauma or to the deficiency of uh, calcium and uh, which are forming the bone and uh, other factors. So here you see that the normal one, here is the normal one. And here is the abnormal one, where the patella is striking against the um, against the uh, condyles of the femur, and because of repeated trauma, there is damage to the articular surface, and that will cause pain. So the person will be unable to run. So that's called as a runner's knee. This is basically related to the patella, posterior surface of patella. It's an abnormal softening uh, under the kneecap is that the patella is also called the knee, kneecap. Uh, the symptoms are vague, discomfort, inner of the knee, and it is aggravated by activity running, jumping, climbing, or descending the stairs. By prolonged with knee in a moderately bent position, patient frequently have abnormal patella tracking towards the lateral side of the femur. So fracture can also occur in this patellar bone. So these are called the knee fractures, patellar fractures. Here you can see. And the, there are, the fractures can occur in four types. There may be undisplayed simple fracture here. There may be transfers, transfers, uh, so fractured means that the two ends, they are away from each other. 
lower uh, tip of the uh, where the region of the patellar ligament that the lower or upper pole that can be damaged combined means that it is divided into different parts and vertical fracture uh, here is the vertical this was a horizontal and this is vertical fracture so these are the five types of fractures that can occur in the patella so signs will be there will be pain by movement muscle will be uh, garden with the passive movement and de decrease function of the part swelling deformity abnormal movement shape localized tenderness at the site because here it is again associated with the quadriceps muscles the function of the quad quadriceps muscle will be impaired because it is the quadriceps muscle they produce their action through attachment with the patella now the treatment uh, is sometimes conservative and sometimes surgical here are different treatments are given tension banding cannulated leg screws um hemorrhage method of uh, comminuted patellar fracture patellar patellectomy total patellectomy so these are the different options these are only for your interest that i have given this slide uh, otherwise uh, you need not to memorize or you need not to know all these treatment options you what you must know that uh that the because of the problem with the patella fracture of the patella the movements they are disturbed and basically it is through the quadriceps muscle and you should have a little bit knowledge of this uh, types of the patella fractures so the very first thing very common thing that we see uh, uh, when we go to the clinics of the neurophysicians are when we are having examination of the nervous system of the spinal cord level at the level of um, uh, lumbar spine uh, to check the lumbar plexus is the reflex action as in the upper limb we have seen we are producing reflex action of the for the biceps for the triceps and uh, uh, this is produced in this way having a soft hammer which is uh, which you strike against the tendon and the muscle that muscle that contracts reflexly so here the doctor has striking against the patellar ligament and in this way actually it has stimulated the quadriceps muscle and it means that you should not sit before the patient for the knee jerk reflex action you should and the doctor should sit on the side otherwise this thing will happen so here is shown the mechanism reflex hammer is striking is the patellar ligament patellar tendon and then it is transmitted to the quadriceps femoris biceps femoris muscle flexor and these are the extensors so through this muscle stretch receptors they are stimulated they are taken to the spinal cord here the cell bodies and here are the interneurons through this interneuron they are attached back to the so the information is coming in this yellow line is here is the interneuron then through this interneurons impulse is given to the motor part which travels back to the uh, the ham, hamstring part of muscles as well as the the quadriceps muscles and reflex uh, twitching or reflex action these muscles are contracted so this is so here is the level is on the spinal cord level it's not the it is not here the neuron is involved here is no neuron is involved interneuron so it is at the spinal cord level is a, it has nothing to do with the upper uh, uh, part of the nervous system that is the brain so it reflexation is locally located uh, basically located at the spinal cord level it can be modified by the neurons coming from the brain so uh, which are basically uh, actually inhibitory one when the upper motor neuron they are they are lost 
so this reflex become exaggerated because of loss of inhibitory action by the upper neurons coming from the brain so it is a very important uh, uh, reflexation done mostly by the physicians to check the integrity of the lumbar spine uh, if the if they are exaggerated means they uh, there is uh, upper motor neuron lesion and if this uh, action is absent reflex action so it means the problem is here at the lower motor neuron there is no reflex action means problem is at the lower motor neurons then you see here is the gracilis so gracilis you now recall in your mind the region insertion and action of the gracilis is it is included into the adductor uh, compartment of the muscles of the uh, thigh and uh, it's a short muscle means uh, it's not a big bulky muscle it's a strap like muscle so this muscle which is a weak adductor and a weak rotator of the thigh and knee it is not so functionally other muscles are present which can compensate it so the muscles gracilis muscles can be taken here you can see this is the gracilis muscle on the medial side of the thigh along with that is the adductor magnus muscle which is strong very strong here is the gracilis here is the adductor magnus very strong adductor of the thigh so this muscle can be taken without impairing the adductor function of the thigh and this muscle can be used uh, obviously this will be taken with this blood supply and this way this can be used to replace the deltoid reconstruction uh, reconstruction elbow flexion elbow extension finger flexion and finger extension here they can be used this muscle can be used also here you can see this muscle is placed over the to replace the masseter action uh, of the uh, mouth or to reconstruction of the facial surgery here gracil muscle is used other muscle which can be used are the radial one is the radial artery is taken to replace it and here is the gracilis muscle now is the so what we learn is that the gracilis muscle itself can be used as a graft you can free the gracilis muscle and you can uh, graft it for the uh, reconstruction of the for the functional purpose and for the cosmetic reasons for the face groin strain adductor muscle strain that's why it is called as groin pull what is it a strain a stretch or tear of a muscle or tendon and it is it, uh, it is called as a, such an injury pulled muscle the muscle is in your groin helps bring your legs together and there are two muscles that may commonly be get injured in the groin strain adductor magnus and sartorius so these muscles when they are uh, injured your legs can be cannot be uh, uh, pulled together closer so that's why it is called as groin pull the two muscles are involved adductor magnus and sartorius groin pull occur in one or more of the adductor muscles of the inner thigh gracilis adductor longus adductor magnus adductor brevis and pectineus some of the n1 can involve and along with that is a sartorius which can be involved which is not a adductor rather it is an abductor but it can be affected in the groin pull okay so that's an and here i have shown you as uh, this is more concerned with the physiotherapy department but 
you can also understand here an exercise to safely strengthen your adductors here is the exercise to strengthen the adductors when you have a groin pull or adductor muscle strain this exercise should be used to strengthen them femoral line we have seen the uh, studied the femoral triangle and in the femoral triangle we know that the uh, in the content of the femoral triangle are the femoral artery vein and femoral canal and uh, here in this region, we can locate the femoral vein and it can be used for the cannulation for the placement of the central line. Central line that means it will move directly into the inferior vena cava through this femoral vein, fem from the femoral vein into the external iliac vein, then into the common iliac vein, then into the inferior vena cava. And that inferior vena cava, through that inferior vena cava, vena cava you can ascend up to the right atrium of the heart. So that's the femoral. Other sides of the central line, you know, there is subclavian artery or the uh, uh, internal jugular vein, uh, a subclavian vein or the internal jugular vein, which are used to, for the placement of the central line, and those are located in the neck region. So if you cannot uh, use those lines, you can use the femoral vein for placement of central line. Here you see the how to locate that. Femoral, for the, this is for the femoral artery cannulation. Here you can see how to locate. Here is femoral triangle. Here is the femoral artery. If you place your little finger over the uh, anterior spiralic spine, and your thumb over the pubic tubercle and you place your hand in this position so it is this one here is the artery this one here will be the uh, femoral artery and you can feel the pulse of the artery here also and from this point you can go into the artery and medial to the artery is the vein Cannulation of femoral artery is done for the angiography purposes very often for the cardiac angiography. A long catheter is passed through the femoral artery and goes up to the region of iota where the coronary artery they are getting region from the aortic sinuses and uh, then there the dye is injected and then this can, catheter can also move into the left ventricle and by injecting the dye we can take the photograph or make the uh, movie and in this way the coronary angiography is done. So here we see cannulation of the femoral artery for the coronary angiography inserting percutaneously that's why it is called as percutaneous coronary angiography so insertion of catheter sheath and dilator along with the guide wire here you can see they are pressing into the and this can be done by locating the first locating the site of femoral artery in the femoral triangle Uh, here is some misnomer that is given into the KLM that uh, in the clinical staff and some vascular laboratories, there, there is a textbook which name the term, use the term superficial femoral vein, uh, referring to the femoral vein before it is joined the accompanying vein of the deep artery of the thigh, deep femoral vein. So primary care physician may not have taught or may not realize that so-called superficial femoral vein is, is actually a deep vein and that acute thrombosis of this vessel is potentially life-threatening. So this misnomer of superficial femoral vein should not be used because if there is damage to this superficial vein uh, that can be potentially uh, life-threatening 
Actually, it is a deep vapor wind. And thrombosis in this wind can be potentially dangerous. So this misnomer should be avoided. Pulmonary um, uh, embolism, they originate in the deep veins, not the superficial ones. So we ignore the superficial ones and uh, uh, care for the deep. Actually, we, what we are naming the superficial is actually is the deep one. Um, then the, uh, 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 this uh, risk can be reduced by the empty coagulant. Cephanavirix. Cephanavirix. Varicose. It, this word is from the varicose veins. Here is a saphenous wing. You can appreciate the swelling here. There is a saphenavirix, which is 4 cm below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Saphenavirix is actually dilatation of the top of the long saphenous vein, great saphenous vein, due to the available incompetence. And here, where it is joining the deep uh, femoral vein. Soft, compressible, Obviously, it is filled with the venous blood and uh, when you will lie down, this will disappear and expansile cuff reflex is there also. So, in every respect, if we see, it can, it can be, uh, it can resemble with the femoral hernia or the inguinal hernia. Because these properties are also of the hernia. Because the hernias, they are also soft compressible they disappear on line lining uh, lying down on the bed and uh, there is a cuff impulse uh, but the fluid thrill is not common in the hernias that is specific to the saphenavirix so we have to differentiate between the saphenavirix and the hernias also Now is the femoral hernia, groin swelling. Femoral hernia, uh, you can see here, the anatomy of the femoral sheath has been shown here. Femoral sheath having most laterally the artery vein, then there is the femoral canal. So to understand the femoral hernia, Anatomy of the femoral canal is very important to be understood. Space just medial to the vein is the femoral canal. Fat and nodes are there, uh, lymphatic nodes are there. So, the wall of femoral hernia will be formed by vein laterally, ligament anteriorly, pelvic bone covered by the iliopectineal ligament posteriorly and the lacrimal ligament which is very important are gimbernets medially it is located medially actually, actually it is an extension of the inguinal ligament over the pectineal line lacunar ligament because it resembles uh, like a lacuna a moon like that that's why it is called as lacunar ligament so the anatomy of the femoral canal is very important for us to learn before we understand the femoral hernia. How this hernia then occurs is shown here that here is a loop of small intestine. It is entering to the inner opening of the femoral canal which is connecting to the anterior uh, uh, internal abdominal wall and through here this loop of small intestine is running down into the femoral canal and is coming out at the lower end of the femoral canal in the region of saphenous opening, saphenous opening. So then it, it it will produce swelling here, and you can see that how small it is when it comes out. How difficult for these contents to go back into the abdomen. So whenever this hernia will occur, uh, there are more chances of the strangulation of the hernia, femoral hernia. So here is the mechanism of femoral hernia. So in the exam you may be given a scenario of the femoral hernia and then you may be asked about the saphenovirex or you may be asked about the 
boundaries of the femoral canal. You may be asked about the normal anatomy of the femoral canal, normal boundaries of the femoral canal. Here you can very well see. Here is a more sophisticated diagram, which is, uh, here is another diagram which is showing the two hernias. One is the, in the inguinal region and one is over the, maybe, uh, from the femoral canal. So if see if you see this hernia, this is below, below the pubic tubercle. If you uh, and this, if you see this sac of this hernia, this is above this one. This is sac of indirect inguinal and this is sac of femoral hernia. So it is behind the inguinal ligament. It is over the. It runs over the, it is through the defect in the inguinal uh, canal in the superficial inguinal ring. It's coming from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. It's the internal opening, it's the external opening. So here you can appreciate the difference between the inguinal as well as femoral hernia. This is very important too differentiate between the two hernias because the treatment of the two hernias is different and chances of strangulations are more in the femoral hernia than in the inguinal hernia. This diagram uh, I have shown you uh, one of the artists uh, is marvelous. You can have many of this if you go to the YouTube or you go to the Google Play and 3D Anatomy you can find this artist drawing all these diagrams within minutes and now this explains us very well how the hernia is going to take place. So here is shown the hernia through the great surface vein opening. Okay, now, now are the uh, Tronchiotaric, ischial bursitis, psoas bursa, hamstring strain. So we will discuss these things in the inshallah in the next lecture, and um, inshallah well, then we will complete our uh, the. Although the clinicals are very short, I have uh, actually I have uh, formed these slides in such a way that you should have a better understanding of these things actually to understand it so inshallah we will continue next time and allah, allah hafiz see you inshallah